So last week we started the exploratory data analysis uh, chapter. Uh, we had gone halfway through the uh, exercises, and I think we have three more exercises left. I thought I'll just go through uh, the initial part of the chapter just just as a recap. Uh, so this chapter essentially talks about how we can use uh, visual different forms of vis visualizations to uh, explore data, and it starts with talking about how we can uh, you know look at variations within one variable. Uh, and a good way to do that, if it's a categorical variable, is just to use geom bar. Uh, but uh, in case it's uh, not a categorical variable, uh, then we can use things like a histogram uh, to plot the uh, 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 to plot the density of uh, you know counts. And another interesting uh, approach that this chapter shows is the use of a geom freak poly function. So this essentially uh, is for cases where uh, we have a we have uh, one continuous variable here. Carrot is a continuous variable, and we have another uh, categorical variable. Cut being the categorical variable. So when we uh, uh, plotted that, we used geom freak poly and uh, used different lines of codes, uh, different uh, different colors uh, to represent different lines with uh, the categorical variable. And uh, then the chapter moved on to, uh, you know, talking in uh, in a little bit more detail about histogram. How can we use the pin width to uh, kind of zoom into uh, unusual values? Uh, uh, that was more or less it. Uh, there was this uh, one nice function called chord uh, underscore Cartesian. Uh, we can use. Uh, uh, the limit function to uh, kind of provide a limit uh, on the x or the y axis. Uh, we also saw last week that the difference between quad underscore Cartesian and uh, x limit or y limit functions is that the x limit function kind of uh, removes all the rows that are outside of the limits provided within this function, whereas uh, quad underscore Cartesian just zooms into uh, this range that we are providing. So it does not remove it from the data set. So that was an interesting uh, difference to note. We went through these exercises. Uh, then we looked at uh, how to zoom into missing values. One way would be to use the filter function to remove any missing values or using the if else statement to convert missing values into something else or you know, outliers into missing values, uh, vice versa. Um, uh, that was the end of the section where we were diving into one particular variable or looking at the variation within a particular uh, variable. We next moved on to covariation, uh, uh, trying to assess the relationships between two different variables. And the first one was the relationship between a categorical and a continuous variable. Uh, we saw that free quality could be a uh, good uh, use case for these types of situations where we have one continuous variable and we want to see how that varies with uh, another categorical variable. Here we saw that uh, the density function uh, uh, was pretty useful. So we can, uh, if we do not provide the density function, uh, the x, the, the y-axis essentially represents the counts for each uh, x. And that might be misleading uh, if uh, one particular category category is like highly uh, skewed. So, for example, uh, in this case, we see that a lot of diamonds in the diamonds data set was uh, were from the ideal category. Uh, when we did not use y equal to density, uh, ideal was uh, shooting really up, uh, as seen by the yellow line right here, which uh, is kind of miss. Uh, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive. It does not really uh, uh, show us the real picture. Uh, whereas when we use y equal to density, the area under the graph is the uh, kind of represents uh, how the distribution is shaped. Uh, so now when we use y equal to density, we see that uh, all of the all of the categories are more or less uh, comparable. Uh, we next saw that uh, apart from free quality box plots are a useful way to uh, kind of uh, visualize a categorical variable with a continuous variable. Uh, and it's pretty simple to do. We specify the X and the Y values in the AES. 
uh, within the AES and then uh, do a geom underscore box plot. Uh, that was it. We saw how we can reorder uh, 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 the categories of the categorical variable by specifying reorder the variable number and then how do we want to reorder? So if we want to reorder it by another variable, say highway, we say that, okay, reorder it by highway and reorder it in an increasing order of the median uh, of the highway for each of these groups. That was, uh, that was interesting too. Um, yeah, I think we had stopped here uh, and uh, we can start with the uh, exercises for today. Uh, do we have any any thoughts, comments, questions before we dive in? All right. So uh, the first question was: uh, Use what I, what you have learned to uh, improve the visualization of departure times of cancelled versus non-cancelled flights. Uh, this is exactly. Uh, uh, what we were talking about when we spoke about the uh, y equals to density uh, uh, argument. So when we do not provide the y equals uh, density, we see that the non-cancelled flights, uh, sorry, the cancelled flights are so few in number that this comparison does not make sense. So we are uh, mutating the flight data set to create a uh, you know, cancelled versus non-cancelled variables. So cancelled means, so cancelled true means the flight was cancelled. Cancelled false means the flight was not cancelled. Here we see that there's a huge difference in the graphs uh, since we are plotting the counts for each of the uh, scheduled uh, departure times. Uh, whereas if we uh, use the density function, uh, the graphs then become comparable and uh, we, can, we can then, uh, uh, you know, uh, draw conclusions from uh, this sort of a comparison. So that was helpful. Uh, the second problem was what variable in the diamond data set is most important for predicting the price of a diamond? Uh, so this is where we uh, get into a little bit of a exploratory mode. So we first try to look at the relationship between price and the variable cut. So cut is a huh, cut uh, is a so cut is a categorical variable, uh, and what we are trying to see here is uh, how does the relationship between carrot and price uh, change with different values for cut. So we are uh, trying to color the uh, values for cut. Uh, we can. I did not provide any value for color here, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know why that was showing. Uh, so anyway, so first we try to explore the relationship between cut and price. Uh, so we see that, so we plot cut in the x-axis and uh, we use box plots to look at the variations in price. We see that it varies, uh, but but not too much. Uh, we then try to look at the relationship between carrot and price, and now carrot is a continuous variable. So we uh, use a scatter plot, and we also use the geom smooth function. Yeah, so uh, here we see that uh, there's a very direct uh, and almost an exponential kind of a relationship between carrot and price, uh, which is very strong. So this variable definitely uh, uh, is associated with uh, the price uh, variable. Uh, we then try to look at it with color. Uh, and we see that uh, with color, also the price varies, but not as much as it uh, as the as the relationship with carrot. 
uh, we also try it with clarity and uh, we see that there are variations, but again, not as strong as uh, the caret function. Uh, so the next question is, uh, so we see that caret uh, is the variable which varies the most with price. Uh, and then the next question is, how is the variable correlated with cut? Uh, so to do that, we uh, use cut in the, the categories of cut in the x-axis. So we see that uh, caret and cut also are uh, sort of associated uh, with increasing, uh, uh, with sorry, with decreasing order of cuts, uh, the values for uh, caret kind of increases. So ideal is the best kind of diamond and it has the lowest, uh, you know, caret value. Uh, and here, I think finally they asked, why does the combination of those two relationships lead to lower quality of diamonds being more expensive? Uh, this is where I, I thought that, you know, using color might be helpful. And I, I developed this chart, but I'm not very sure if this is the best chart to answer the question. Has anybody else tried this last part of, the, of this question? Mm -hmm. This makes uh, kind of reading the graph a little difficult with all of these different colors. Uh, but the geom smooths are really helpful. So we can see that ideal has a different. So if we compare ideal and fair, we see that the uh, that the relationship between carrot and price is stronger for ideal diamonds as compared to and not as strong for uh, you know fair diamonds so maybe that is a cue that we can use to uh, look at the look at these relationships in a bit in a bit more detail so yeah so that was the second question the third question was install uh, the gg stance package and create a horizontal box plot how does it compare to using quad underscore flip uh, so first we use the quad underscore flip uh, option we see uh, we try to plot the uh, cut of a diamond with the carrot and uh, this is how it looks uh, so the cut is in the y-axis now, and the caret values are in the x-axis. Uh, using GG stance, I installed GG stance, and uh, GG stance has this uh, function called geom underscore box plot h, which converts it automatically to uh, the uh, to uh, kind of a flipped axis. The only difference between box plot h and box plot is that we have to flip the coordinates right here. So in uh, when we were using quad underscore flip, we just specified our x as cut and y as caret, and then flipped the whole thing. Uh, whereas in box plot h, we uh, have to reverse gears right here. We have to mention that, OK, y is actually the cut variable, and x is, is the caret. And then it generates something very similar. So yeah, that's that's one small uh, difference between these two options. Uh, the next one was, uh, uh, the next problem says that one problem with box plot is that they were developed in an era of much smaller data sets and tend to display a prohibitively large number of outlying values. One approach to remedy this problem is to use letter value plot. Uh, so it asks, asks us to plot that. So uh, this is what a letter value uh, plot looks like. Uh, pretty simple to plot, actually. Uh, similar AES ag uh, aesthetic arguments for X and Y. Uh, the only difference is that this, unlike a box plot, this does not show us any outlier values per se. Uh, the thicker, so the, the thicker, uh, region at the base of this letter value essentially means that there are, there are a 
larger number of observations here. And uh, it kind of uh, narrows down like a tower as we move up, which shows that there are far fewer uh, values uh, when it comes to uh, price. So comparing uh, these two pillars, we can say that you know there are there are a there are a larger number of highly priced ideal diamonds as compared to the number of diamonds that are highly priced that are fair. So so that yeah that that could be useful uh, depending on our situation. It definitely is a slightly bit more informative than the box plot, which only shows us uh, you know how many outliers there are and how far they are from the median or the intra uh, quartile range. Uh, this is a little bit uh, more informative uh, in the sense that it also shows uh, how many observations do we have at each of these levels. Um, any, any questions or thoughts here on return values? Okay. Mm. So the next question was compare and contrast geom violin with a faceted geom histogram or a colored geom freak poly. What are the pros and cons for each methods? Mm. So we uh, plot all three, uh, we plot uh, the same thing using all three methods. Uh, first, we try to look at the relationship between uh, the distribution of price, let's say. So, Okay, so yeah, so first we use a, uh, the uh, face it function, uh, which is pretty straightforward. It's uh, faceting uh, the whole data set by cuts for fair, good, very good, premium, and ideal. And uh, it's giving us a distribution uh, at a given bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth. Uh, using uh, Geom violin, uh, we can uh, do something similar. So for each of the cuts, we have a distribution of, uh, you know, what the prices are. And this is, this is slightly more comprehensive because here we can again see what we, uh, uh, what we found in the letter value plots. Uh, here we see that, you know, ideal has a large number of diamonds that are, that are priced towards the lower end. Uh, this distribution is quite different from, uh, you know, uh, diamonds that are fair uh, cut uh, and so on and so forth. And finally, we repeat what we did with the freak poly uh, kind of a graph. We use the density function and we uh, kind of look at the uh, frequent, the density distributions for each type of cut uh, across price. So those three methods are uh, really interesting, uh, specifically when we are looking at plotting something, plotting two variables, one of which is a categorical variable like cut, and the second one is a continuous variable like price or carrot. So that was very interesting. Uh, the next question was about GGB swarm. Uh, I looked it up. It's a pretty interesting uh, uh, way to plot uh, a categorical variable with a continuous variable. Somehow, when I run it, my it doesn't run for me. It, it, it just hangs. Has anybody tried the vSwarm function by any chance? Am I, am I doing something wrong? Any experiences with this at all? Okay. Uh, if not, I think we can move on and okay. Let's see a chat. Okay. Yeah, this is the first time I was using it as well. I mean, actually, I I don't know if we are doing something wrong or, but maybe worth exploring. I think it was interesting to. Look at so it, it 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 generates quite interesting plots. But just to keep in mind that you know this is another option that we have in our pockets uh, when we are doing categorical versus continuous variables. So moving on, uh, 
The next category is when we have two categorical variables. And when we have something like this, there are uh, two major options to go about. First is to use the geom count function. So let's say we have cut and color, both of which are categorical variables. Uh, the geom count function kind of plots both of these uh, in x and y axes, and uh, the size of the bubble right here represents how many uh, number of observations we have in each of these subgroups. So it's pretty uh, visual and very uh, pretty straightforward. I think we can pretty easily say that oh, we have you know ideal and uh, so diamonds that are ideal and color G are, you know, pretty common to find or something like that. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, another way is to uh, use the mutate function to count, to either, uh, you know, count the number of observations in each of these groups or uh, the average in each of these subgroups, and then use the geom underscore, underscore tile function uh, to create something like this. So this is essentially uh, uh, cut versus color. And the shade uh, in each of these tiles represent uh, either how many number of observations we have or any other parameter that we want to pass on to this argument. Uh, so so uh, just to repeat, I think we have geom underscore count, which generates something like this. And then we have geom underscore tile, uh, which creates a really good uh, uh, kind of a plethora of colors right here. Uh, so let's go on to the exercises. Uh, the first one is, uh, how could you rescale the count data set uh, above to more clearly show the distribution of cut within color or color within cut? Uh, so let's repeat what they did first. Uh, so the first graph that they generate is uh, pretty simple. So color versus cut, and then uh, we have uh, the count, so, so the so the color here is represented by uh, the count of observations that we have at each of these cross sections, uh, at each cross section of color and cut. Uh, so that's pretty. That's that's uh, what they did in the uh, chapter descriptions. Uh, but now they're asking uh, how can we show better uh, if we if we want to show cut within color or color within cut. Uh, so one way to go about it could be uh, to use the mutate function to generate the proportion of uh, you know one within the other. So let's 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 first look at how the count uh, data set looks like. So this is uh, so first we have fair and then all the colors within fair and then we have a number. Uh, uh, the number of observations that we have within uh, each of these categories. Uh, if we want to show how color is represented within cut, we can look at the proportion uh, of these numbers rather than looking at just the numbers themselves. So what we do is we use the mutate function to generate a new variable called proportion, uh, which is just uh, this number divided by the total uh, number, the total sum. Uh, and we then pass that on to the uh, uh, to, to ggplot and uh, use proportion to uh, to fill our geom underscore time. Uh, so this is exactly how it looks like. And uh, here we can see that uh, numbers has been has now been replaced by proportion. So this this essentially is showing how color is represented within cut, if that makes. Sense. Any questions or thoughts? Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, the next question was to use geom tile together with dplyr to explore how average flight delays vary by destination and month of year. What makes the plot difficult to read? How could you improve it? Uh, so we go to the flights data set here, and we have uh, we have the month uh, of operation, and we have the destination as well. So we group by month and destination, and then we calculate the average delay. 
as the mean of arrival delay by ignoring the missing values. Uh, and then we pass that on to the geom tile function. So this is what it looks like. So we have all the destinations on the y-axis and we have all the months on the x-axis. And clearly this is a overcrowded uh, situation because we have so many destinations and we have so many little cross sections for each month within each destination. Uh, so this is a really difficult to read plot for sure, uh, just because we have so many cells. Uh, I don't know how we can improve it. Uh, I don't know what, what we could do to uh, make it look a little better. Any, uh, any ideas? I usually don't use such uh, amazing graphics, so I really don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have, I'm also. I don't know how to how we could improve it. I yeah. I would. I would not not create such a plot with so many different destinations. Maybe we can like combine different destinations. You know, group them into countries or continents or something like that. That yeah, can make yeah, it yeah. a little bit cleaner. Cleaner, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the third question is uh, why is it slightly better to use uh, AES X equals color, Y equals cut versus X equals cut, Y equals color? So basically, this is asking which one is uh, which orientation is better uh, to have color on the X axis and cut on the Y axis or vice versa? So I did both, uh, first color, uh, and then just flipping the coordinates to have cut on the x-axis and color on the y-axis. Uh, I think I, you know, when we plot a graph, we generally see that, uh, we generally try to keep the variable that has more number of categories in the x-axis. So I think that is the only reason that I can think of uh, for which it's slightly better to use uh, color on the x-axis versus uh, y on the uh, cut on the y-axis. So color has more number of categories. So I think it's slightly better to keep it in the x-axis. Any other reasons or any other you know rule of thumbs that you might want to share? Okay, uh, so that brings us to an end of the second exercise for today. The last exercise is about, uh, you know, the cases where we have to plot two continuous variables uh, and see how they co-vary with each other. Uh, the best way to plot that is to just use a scatter plot using geom underscore point. Uh, however, this section talks uh, about a couple of different techniques that we can use to uh, make it look better. So one of the challenges with scatter plots is that with large data sets, there's a lot of overplotting. So there's a lot of points that are plotted on one on top of each other. Uh, one way to rectify that is to use the uh, alpha function to modify the transparency. Uh, so we can use alpha, different values of alpha to uh, look at you know how uh, these are kind of overlapping. Uh, but there's another uh, cool technique uh, which uses geom underscore bind 2D, uh, bin 2D or geom underscore hex. So what this does is that uh, both uh, bin 2D and geom hex, they divide the Cartesian coordinate into, uh, you know, either a, a 2D bin or a hexagonal bin. So bin 2D is creating uh, these little tiny squares and uh, bin uh, geom underscore hex is creating these hexagonal kind of shapes. And then uh, geom hex or geom uh, bin 2D, depending on what we are using, uh, it uses a scale of values to uh, show, you know, how many uh, observations lie uh, in each of these uh, bins that have been created. So lighter shade here means uh, a, a, a denser kind of a, a plot. So 
the lighter the shade, the lighter the bin, it means there are, there are a large number of values in, in this box as compared to some of the other boxes. Uh, so this could be used to see, you know, what are the areas which have a higher density and a higher uh, overlap between, uh, between different points. So that was one technique. Another technique is to uh, is the is to uh, bin one of the continuous variables and then use a box plot. So this is very similar to converting one continuous variable into a categorical variable, and then using a box plot to plot the categorical variable versus versus uh, the continuous variable. So in this example, what happens is caret is a continuous variable. Uh, they use cut underscore width, uh, which is a function that uh, you know uh, creates categories or or cuts a continuous variable depending on the width that we provide. So uh, here, as we can see, there are several uh, uh, bins into which the caret has now been distributed, and each one of them is acting as a separate category within a categorical variable, and that which we can plot against price to see how the relationship is. Another variation for cut underscore width is cut underscore number. The difference is that in cut underscore width, we specify the width. We are in this case specifying that, oh, I want each of the pins to be of a width of 0.1. Whereas in cut number, we specify the, no the total numbers, uh, the total number of cuts that we want. So for example, if we say cut underscore number caret 20, we are essentially saying that we want 20 different uh, cuts right here. Uh, so that was the last technique in the in, in the in the chapter that uh, deals with uh, continuous and continuous variables. Uh, before we go into the exercise, any quick comments from anyone? Okay. So let's dive into it. So the first one is uh, instead of summarizing the conditional distribution with a box plot, uh, you could use a frequency polygon. So here they have uh, used a box plot uh, to represent to to uh, look into the relationship between caret and price. This question says you could also use a frequency polygon. We surely could. So all we are doing here is saying that you know x is x is price y is density and then for color uh, we say that the color is uh, uh, and then we uh, kind of uh, divide the caret into uh, different bins depending on the cut width so this is what happens so depending on uh, the bin width that we have provided i've used one so this uh, currently converts cut into a categorical variable with four categories, minus one to one, one to three, three to five, and five to seven. Uh, and yeah, and then we can see that, oh, uh, what's the area under the graph for uh, cut width of minus one to one. So we see that uh, most of the diamonds uh, that are, uh, that have a cut width of minus one to one, have a lower price, whereas most of the diamonds that have a cut width of five to seven have a higher price range. So that's very that's like another way to uh, go for it. Uh, then we have uh, what do you need to consider when using cut underscore width versus cut underscore number? Uh, so yeah, so I think uh, here in the above example we uh, used cut underscore width, and this is what we were getting. Uh, in the next example, I'm using cut underscore number, and I I, I say that oh, cut uh, caret into three groups. Uh, this is fine. The only difference that I can think of is, and I may be wrong, uh, that when we are using cut underscore width, since it's not dealing with numbers at all, it's it's kind of creating these bins based on a width that we have provided. We should be using the density function, whereas but when we are cutting it by number, we want to say that, oh, uh, create three groups. Yeah, create three groups for numbers. 
maybe we don't need to use the density function. Uh, not sure. Maybe. But yeah, this doesn't make much sense. Actually, we should be using the density function on this. Okay. Any 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 comments here? Yeah, it's almost the same distribution. But I think another uh, consideration that we have uh, that we have to make when choosing the cut width is that the choice of the bin width uh, kind of makes or breaks the game. So when we choose caret equals to 0.5, we see that there is a lot of categories that were created, and you know it's really difficult to uh, make any sense out of it. Uh, so we uh, we need to toy around with the bin width to get an optimal number of you know what makes sense what is visually appealing and so on and so forth so i thought caret width 2 was really making sense uh, similarly for numbers we can provide a lot of numbers right here uh, it would uh, kind of uh, complicate our graphs so we we need to arrive at a decent number too Uh, that was the first problem, I think. Yeah. The second one was uh, visualize the distribution of caret partitioned by price. So this is very straightforward. Uh, what we do is we say that uh, y is caret and then x is, uh, they said partition by price. Uh, so we are partitioning it in two ways. First, we are using cut width. Uh, we say that okay, cut it by uh, a price of you know uh, a bin width of two thousand dollars, and this gives us something like this, uh, where we see that the higher the price range, the more the variability. Uh, we can achieve something similar by using cut number instead of cut width, and here we say that oh, uh, I'm using cut number, and we'll uh, we'll create twenty categories for price. And uh, here is how it looks. Uh, I think it it again follows the same trend. And uh, of course, we can we can play around with this. We can reduce two thousand to a say a thousand and and get get at some a similar relationship. So that takes care of the second problem. Uh, the third problem was how does the price distribution of very large diamonds compare to small diamonds? So here we, uh, let's take an example. Let's say we're looking at the number. So if if we take carrot as the, you know, size of diamonds, they are trying to uh, assess the price distribution of very large diamonds compared to small diamonds. So we see that larger the diamond is or more the carat value, more is the distribution. Huh, did that make sense? No. Okay, I think we should flip this actually. Yeah, so uh, what we do here is we are partitioning uh, carrot into multiple bins and we are looking at the distribution of price. So we see that larger the uh, size of the diamond or larger the carrot value, more is the distribution or, or, or wider the range for price. So in, a, in other words, it means that, you know, very large diamonds can have a wide range in price. So some very large diamonds can be uh, very can be very cheap, or some very large diamonds can be like supremely expensive. However, when we look at the smaller carat sizes, we see that oh, the range is like really small. So there's not a lot of variation in price uh, when it comes to smaller diamonds. Um, I don't know why that is, but this definitely holds. Uh, ground and it's it's pretty the trend is like pretty uh, clear right here 
unfortunately i, I do not know enough about diamonds to <laughs> figure out why this is happening but yeah that's how the institution is any ideas on what's going on why do we have a lesser range for smaller diamonds Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, the next one was combine two of the techniques that you have learned to visualize the combined distribution of cut, carrot, and price. Now, between these three variables, carrot and price are continuous variables, and cut is a categorical variable. So, one way to do it is to, uh, since cut is categorical, we can use cut as the as a facet wrap, and then simply uh, do a geom hex kind of a thing. So here we have x as the uh, carrot in the x-axis, price in the y-axis, and then we also have, we are using geom hex, so we know uh, where the distributions are, where, where there's a lot of overlap uh, in count. And then we we simply use facet wrap to create different uh, grids for uh, different cuts of diamonds. So this is one way we could, we could just use geom plot instead of geom hex that would work too. Uh, another way is to uh, is to uh, do what we have been doing in the earlier examples to use uh, to partition the partition one of the continuous variables uh, using cut bit or cut underscore number uh, and then use the color argument uh, and pass on uh, the cut variable into the color argument. So this is how it looks. It becomes a little complicated because uh, there's a lot going on here. We have five categories for cut, and we also have uh, you know different uh, cut widths that get generated. Now we can simplify this by uh, you know specifying a wider uh, range for price. So maybe we say that okay, the cut width is ten thousand. So that reduces that clears up the graph a little bit more. Uh, this creates only three categories and, and now we can see how uh, cut varies uh, and how is the, how's the relationship between these three variables. So these were the two methods that I explored. I'm pretty sure that there could be other ways to do it. Uh, this brings us to the last question. Uh, so two dimensional plots reveal outliers that are not visible in one dimensional plots. Uh, for example, some points, points in the plot below have an unusual X and Y value. So uh, there are these, uh, so when we uh, plot X and Y, which is I think the length and the width of diamonds, we see that, uh, you know, there are quite a quite a bit of outliers from this relationship. Otherwise it's, uh, it's, it's a very strong relationship between X and Y. Uh, however, we see some uh, outliers when we look at the scatter plot. This question says that uh, if we had looked at just uh, the x-axis and the y-axis, uh, we might not have uh, identified these values as outliers uh, within that variable. Uh, so the question then says that, uh, you know, which uh, some points in the plot below have an unusual yeah, so why is a scatter plot a better display than a wind plot for this case? So we do both. Uh, let's do a scatter plot first. So this is a scatter plot, and we see that there are, uh, we can visually identify a couple of outliers right here. Uh, but when we bin it, so let's say we are binning the x variable using cut numbers and keeping the y uh, variable in the y-axis and then using a geom underscore box plot. Huh. Yeah, so essentially what this plot is telling us is that there's a, so the observations that we found in the graph above, uh, so those observations are lost. Here we Kind of, we do not see a lot of outliers, and here we are. We kind of see that okay, within each 
bin width or within each bin of x, there's there's very little variation within y, uh, which is which is obvious because x and y had such a strong relationship. But then, uh, since we are not using that scatter plot, we we cannot really visualize uh, and visually identify any outliers uh, that are, you know, falling outside that uh, strong uh, regression line that we could see in the earlier graph. I think this is a disadvantage of uh, using or binning uh, one continuous variable into a categorical variable, because by doing so, we can miss out on on uh, visual information like identifying outliers. So. I think this is meant to be as a cautionary point that, uh, you know, do not directly go in and start binning continuous variables and uh, plotting. Uh, first, it all, I think it always makes sense to use a scatter plot and then uh, try to improve upon that using uh, cut width or cut bins, or, uh, cut numbers or something like that. So that is it. That is the end of the exploratory data analysis chapter. Thank you so much for your patience, in, in everyone. This, uh, yeah. I don't know. In this uh, bean versus scatter plot, I would say uh, when you are beaning that, uh, uh, can you keep that bean chart? Uh, in this uh, graph, you are uh, visualizing the outlier within each category of the bean. Yes. But when you are putting it in a scatter plot, now you are seeing outlier with respect to the whole distribution. Yes. Not within just one category. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Here I think yeah, I think you're right. For example, here we do see a couple of outliers, but those are within this this specific bin. Within one bin, one particular bin, uh, the outlier belongs to. Yeah. But yeah. when you are seeing a scatter plot, then the outlier belongs to the whole distribution. Yep. Yep. That will yep. be clearer when we come to modeling part. I see. Okay. 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 But yeah, that makes sense. Here, I think we have a lot more. Uh, uh, you know, we can we can visually identify a lot more outliers as we did in the previous example. Yep. Makes sense. Thank you, Malik. Welcome. So that is it from my side today. Thank you, uh, Arnav. Really good presentations. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> uh, so can we have, I think uh, uh, Minakshi had volunteered for 8 and the 10th chapter. Uh, awesome. Will that be okay? Yep, yep, yep. yep. Yes. Okay, then we'll have that. Will do you want to split it in two weeks or? Uh, yeah, I I think we will have to split it into two weeks to uh, do justice with it. So I will do that. Great, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'll also do the data uh, data import chapter then the eleventh chapter. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Arnab. Bye. Bye.